Hey everybody, it's Leon from Essential Edit, and the following is a podcast interview that I did with Henry Chen from the Wedding Photography Podcast. If you haven't checked him out yet, please do check the link below and go dive into some of the deep issues that he's covering for photographers. I think you will enjoy. Now, three things that we talk about in this episode, among many, would be number one, tips for photographers who are just getting started with their business. Having a hard deadline. Do you have a hard deadline when it comes to post-production? Tips for the perfectionist photographer who feels that they just could never outsource their photo editing. Hey, give it a listen and let me know what you think. Wedding Photography Podcast, episode number 40. Wedding post-production tips and tricks with Leon Sandoval of Essential Edit. Well, hello everyone. Welcome to the big four zero episode number 40. We made it this far since we got started with episode number one in October of last year. I hope wedding season is going well for you, especially those of us that are living in the summertime here in the States. It's July and things are just crazy. I can't wait to share with you this interview I have in this episode with a new colleague and friend of mine, Leon Sandoval of Essential Edit. I had this interview a few weeks ago, but it was great talking about wedding post-production, workflow, color correcting, most importantly, how that will help you take your business to new heights, to that next level. Before I get too carried away and share with you that interview, this is a podcast to help wedding photographers to go full-time. It doesn't matter if you're starting out on the fence or already a seasoned pro, I want to help you do this full-time and dare I say, have a successful lifestyle, making six figures, having wedding photography as the engine for your entire life. First and foremost, I want to give a huge shout out, as always, to my old time listeners, but new ones that have found me through Instagram. It's been wonderful connecting with you guys through the messages, the comments, the ones that have taken the time to email me directly. Absolute blast. That's one of the main reasons I wanted to do this podcast to connect with you guys all and do whatever I can to help you with your business. So keep those comments, messages, emails coming. Related to that, for those of you that have already subscribed to my email list, probably through the website weddingphotographypodcast.com, thank you for that. However, I do have to apologize. I have yet to send out a newsletter or email blast or anything like that yet. Been pretty busy photographing weddings as well as doing this podcast and a few other ventures. Don't want to make too much of excuse for myself, but I do want to apologize and call myself out. But thank you for subscribing. If you haven't already, please do. When the time comes, when I finally send my first newsletter, I want to make sure it gets out to you. In the meantime, Continue to listen to this podcast. I'll have all updates and information here and most likely also on my Instagram account. Of course, that's at Wedding Photography Podcast. Those are the best ways to keep in touch with new episodes and just anything that's coming down the pipeline. And one last thing, depending on when you listen to this, it is scheduled to air pretty much at the end of July on the 28th. But in a few days, I will be heading out to Africa right at the end of the month on the 31st, my wife and I are switching our wedding photography brains, at least for me. She's a pharmacist, so she's switching that part of her brain off. And we're going to go on our next trip to Uganda and Tanzania. As some of you know, about 70-80% of my entire life is revolved around wedding photography. But when I get a chance a few times a year, I love to be a travel photographer, a blogger, a podcaster in that department. And related to this episode, all about post-production workflow, the reason I'm able to do that, my other ventures, my passion as a traveler, a traveler photographer, is because I outsource my post-production, the color correction. So even though I'm having six weddings this month, five next month, I'm able to squeeze in a week and a half of travel and go on our next trip to Africa. 
But nevertheless, we're still going to have new episodes. That's the plan for the next couple Thursdays. Certainly when I get back, continuing on with newer episodes. But yes, depending on when you listen to this, I'm going to be in the middle of nowhere, hopefully doing guerrilla trekking in Uganda, seeing the great migration, visiting some villages, some schools, communities, all that good stuff in Tanzania. If you are into travel, as always, check out my travel podcast, Only a Day Away, and also the Instagram for that is at Henry Chen one as in the number one. Sorry about the cheap plug, but I do want to share with all my listeners, be completely transparent on what's going on so you guys see how I manage my time. Sometimes it's crazy, a little hectic, and pretty stressful, but it's always worthwhile. As I mentioned specifically for this episode, you can see the value of outsourcing to another company like Essential Edit because I'm able to use that time to grow my business, to do this podcast, and also my other ventures in traveling. So I don't want to spend too much more time, guys. This is an action-packed episode. The interview I have with Leon is nearly an hour long, but it's chock full of tips, advice, I hope you give the entire episode a listen. There is a little promo code at the end. If you are looking to outsource, looking for an amazing company, I can't recommend Leon with Essential Edit enough. I actually got in touch with him probably about a month or so ago. We exchanged direct messages, some comments on Instagram. I love his warm vibe and his personality, and I thought, what a great person to have on an upcoming episode, and well, this one. And also for my listeners, recently I've been getting more emails about post-production workflow. Some of you have asked me how long I spend on a wedding, doing the color correction, the editing. Others even ask me what computer I use. How am I able to do it so efficiently? For those of you that know me personally, you know that I'm able to post a preview around 50, 60 plus photos after a wedding within a few days. And to my couples, I try to get the entire color corrected wedding gallery anywhere from 7, 800 to even 1,200, 1,300 images out to my brides and grooms within three, maybe four weeks at most. And that's because I'm outsourcing the color correction part of my entire workflow. But we're going to talk about all of that if you have the funds for it. If you don't, the pros, maybe a few cons, probably just the investment. But you'll see what that can do for you, your business, and your entire life. So without further ado, let's get this interview started. As always, I'll see you guys on the other side. Enjoy my time talking with Leon Sandoval of Essential Edit. Thanks, guys. Well, good morning, my friends. I'm super duper thrilled to have a guest of mine, a new friend, a colleague I met just a couple weeks ago, Leon Sandoval of Essential Edit, a wedding post-production workflow company based out of near San Diego. Leon, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing fantastic. Thanks so much for having me on. My pleasure. Thank you so much. This is actually perfect timing. We were just talking offline about how it hasn't been too long, but I wish I started sooner with the outsourcing of color correction, album design, things like that, and how much that has improved not only my workflow, but my lifestyle. So we're going to get into all of that. To our listeners, a little bit of background. I actually connected with Leon just maybe about almost a month ago. Good old Instagram with the hashtags, and we were able to (laughs) exchange a few direct messages and such and finally get this interview. So I'm really thrilled. I want you to just... And this is going to be more of a free-flowing, not much of an interview, but a conversation to give our listeners these tips, tricks, ideas, anything to help them with their workflow and have more time for other things in their life. So a little background, Leon, if you can just talk about, well, just what you're doing every day, how you got started with Essential Edit, just to get our listeners up to speed on your background. Totally. I'll do my best. Yeah. So essentially what I do is I help photographers. That's what I look at as my main goal. Uh, in my in my professional careers to help photographers. And so sometimes that means that my clients are sending us orders and we're doing color correction, retouching, and album design. So that frees up time for them to go do more targeted marketing or work with other vendors or have free time to be with their kids or whatever. Um, but that also means opportunities like this where I can talk with people like you who um, you know have a network of photographers 
maybe they can't outsource. Maybe they can't send their their weddings to uh, somebody uh, to edit. I love giving away information and helping photographers get faster and more accurate with their own workflow. So that's kind of big picture. I love helping photographers. For many years, um, I was a photographer, wedding photographer and portrait photographer. And I, my love affair with photography kind of started in last century. Um, so <laughs> in the early 90s uh, is when I picked up a camera and began shooting. Loved the whole process and um, actually got into doing um, the old wet dark room process where I was processing my own film, making my own prints, working with my high school and college newspapers and that kind of thing. So that's where I spent a lot of time in the early days. And then, um, you know, one of my uh, one of the staff writers of the newspaper in college somehow coerced me into shooting her wedding. And I resisted. <laughs> I said, no, no, there's no way you're going to get me to shoot your wedding. I'm not interested. You've got to find somebody else. And she persisted and she'd call and say, okay, so I was thinking for the wedding day, maybe you could, you know, she's planning it with me. I'm like, no, <laughs> I'm not going to do this. But she talked me into it. And I shot that wedding with my wife as a second shooter who had plenty of photography experience as well. And I realized that it was actually much less pressure than I thought it would be. Because when I went in as a news photographer to an event, I really only had one chance. I had mm -hmm. that one shot that I needed to go on the cover or that one shot that would accompany the, um, the article. And here I had infinite opportunities. I mean, I could tell the story with as many photos as I wanted. So I realized that wedding photography was actually less pressure than being a news photographer. So we did that for several years. And um, right about the time that we had our first kid and, you know, I'd been working as a full-time retoucher as my day job, shooting weddings on the weekends, I got this idea to start an editing and design service for photographers. And I thought maybe within six months or something I could go full-time. And it was only three months when I had wow. too many clients to uh, maintain my day job. <laughs> so um, that was the pro that started about 2004. I started, uh, an editing and design service as a freelancer and that's been my thing ever since. So most of my day involves, um, you know, managing, uh, a team of editors and making sure that they're all up to speed on their techniques and, um, that we're staying up on production. But a lot of my day is spent talking with photographers who have questions about post-production, about our service. And, um, there's this thing in our industry that is, kind of common. There's no water cooler. You know, a lot of people go to work at an insurance company or a marketing company or wherever, and they have an office and they have a break room and they have the water cooler where they can kind of talk about, you know, their day, you know, what was going on last night or yesterday or whenever. Photographers don't really have that. And so they turn to social media and, you know, I like to engage with our clients and, and prospective clients there, give information as I can and um, and help people improve their own workflow. But it's a it's a fun thing in, in our industry, I think, that we don't have the water cooler because we get to meet people that we otherwise wouldn't have. I mean, you're in L.A., I'm in San Diego, so we're on the same coast, but would our paths have crossed if it weren't for social media? Probably not. Definitely, Leon, and you raised some great points, and if there is such a thing as a photographer, now editor running his own company, so-called paying his dues, definitely, Leon. And that's right, it's 2004, not 2014. So you've been in this industry for 12 plus years, and we were actually joking a little bit. I thought, wow, you know all these programs that I'm sure some of our listeners might not have heard of, and you were working in the dark room with the news photographer. Now, even before I even picked up a camera, and so to say <laughs> that you have all this experience and tying that into how you're looking to not only save time to do other things in your business, but you know, have time with your kids, your spouse, and other ventures. That's what really kind of spawned your passion, your interest to help other photographers, which I love. And I also took a look at your website a few weeks ago. And not only, of course, the services you provide, but some tips, some ideas in, on your blog section just to help photographers in general to speed up the workflow. I actually had a couple questions. I know I'm kind of maybe speaking on behalf of some of our listeners is they're of course thinking either, well, I would love to have a service like what Leon's providing, but I'm just getting started. I'm barely paying my bills on the, the equipment or my monthly fees, whatever it might be. How can I justify so-called another cost? What would you say to photographers that are starting out or maybe, yes, the finances are a bit tough to outsource right now? 
Sure, that's a great question. Um, you know, for many years, there was this pushback against outsourcing. And, you know, photographers assumed that they had to do the post-production because they are the artist. And I think what's cool is seeing the, the shift to where now when people go to workshops or conferences, uh, where they go to WPPI in Vegas and they go to listen to these speakers, these speakers say, you know, hey, from the beginning, you need to start outsourcing. And so what's cool is I've seen this transition of people going like, there's no way I could outsource because I'm the artist. I could never release the, the, that, that responsibility to someone else. To now where it's more accepted and where people are actually um, preaching, you got to get started with this in the beginning. But fact is, you're right. A lot of people can't, they don't have the bandwidth. They don't have the, the room in their budget for this kind of service. So I actually kind of was thinking of three things that are more mentality. I mean, there are a million Lightroom um, tutorials on the web that people can go watch. Um, you know, they can sign up for workflow classes and stuff online, which is good. I, I would recommend they do that. But I want to talk to people about mindset because I think the mindset of editing is even more powerful than me teaching you a trick with the exposure slider or white balance, you know, that kind of thing. Because what it comes down to is your, your time management and your mental game when it comes to editing. So for the people who can't afford to outsource, that's fine. Um, learn what you can about Lightroom. Go figure out every keyboard shortcut that you can. Read and listen and educate yourself on how to edit. Call me or email me and ask me questions. I'm glad to answer them. Uh, no requirement to be a client. I, I just love helping people, as I said. So with that, I think there's three things that I want to mention to your listeners. And those three things would just be basically, number one, don't overthink it when it comes to post-production. Don't overthink it. Number two, know your pace. Um, and, I'll, and I'll dive into that a little bit. And then number three may sound a little crazy or a little brash, but it's care a little less. I love the whole think of the mindset. And I know I've been guilty of this many times where we get too lost in the day-to-day -day things, but specifically even the well, I gotta, I gotta slide this, this adjustment a little bit more. This is not quite as sharp, and those are important. But I always think there's no such thing as a perfect photo. You can edit until the cows come home. It'll never be quite what you wanted, but you still have 900 plus photos. And kind of tying that into, uh, to your days as a news photographer, and I'm sure for some of us that shoot editorial and such, a wedding it's not just a handful of photos. We all know that there's hundreds, if not thousands. So, and like you said, we don't have that water cooler break where we can just go and hang out a bit or just take a breather where we're working until, well, we're done. I know you can talk a little bit about that in a bit, Leon, just how we're really yeah. more of the mindset of, well, not by really valuing the hours that we're working. But I love the three tips you give and definitely to go into that just more about the mindset that a photographer could have, not just thinking about the nitty-gritty details. Yeah, sure. I think, you know, one, one thing that I've found is common when I talk to photographers and I've talked to probably at this point tens of thousands of them across the world is that when they daydreamed about being a photographer when they thought you know oh man maybe I'm going to leave my my day job and be a photographer um, chances are pretty good that they never ever included in that daydream sitting at a computer at three in the morning it's the opposite right you when you think about being a photographer you're like oh I'm going to go to these gorgeous <laughs> you know, beaches, and I'm going to go find these really cool urban places, and I'm going to shoot in gorgeous light and have really beautiful clients. And, you know, you, you think of all the cool creative things that you're going to do as a photographer out in the field, but most photographers really underestimate how much time they're going to spend at the desk. And I think one of the things that makes that worse is that most photographers don't have large chunks of time every day to dedicate to post-production. You know, you've got to get on the phone, you're, you're looking for new leads, you're coordinating with, um, you know, a current client, you're following up with a client, you know, you're working with other vendors, you're creating blog posts, you're marketing your business. And so there are a lot of different hats that photographers wear that prevent them from being a professional editor. And so that what that looks like is they might work on, an, uh, on a wedding today for a few hours, and then they have an interruption. They got to take a phone call or go to a consultation, and they don't get back to post production for maybe another couple of days. Mm -hmm. So their their skills are not constantly being sharpened. And so um, 
that's kind of the I think is one of the bigger problems with being a photographer is you have so many hats that it's really hard to become really, really good at post-production because you don't have the time to dedicate to it. But I think with, with the three points that I mentioned, number one, don't overthink it. This is one of those rabbit holes that people get caught in is that they, they feel like they're not amazing in Lightroom. And so they're like, okay, well, maybe I can use some presets to help me out because these presets look amazing. And so <laughs> they go shopping for presets. And, you know, you, you've got one site that will sell you you a thousand presets for 50 bucks and another site that will give you uh, 500 presets for free or whatever and so it's easy to accumulate th this massive library of presets and then they go to edit and they're lost they're like okay well maybe i can apply this what does this preset do what does this one do and so for each image they're kind of shopping for the best preset on that image and i think that's a terrible rabbit hole and terrible time oh, yeah. waster for photographers to get into how many of us um, are sorry to cut you i'm sure a lot of us and i'm guilty when raising my hand when you said that especially when i started out even seven eight plus years ago where we're actually trying to make our photos fit into this this so-called style of preset now before you know we're spending all this time and our styles all over the place and we almost forget what we originally were trying to do which is to right you know color correct and get this stuff done but absolutely i sorry to interrupt you there leon no no it's, that's good i think with photographers a lot of times they don't love doing math and so um let's do a, a quick little uh, math equation so like 700 in Images, if you have 700 images to deliver and you're taking on average two minutes per photo, just trying to select that perfect preset, um, 700 times two is 1400 minutes, and that equals 23 hours total. Nice. And so, there's, there's no, you know, it's no wonder people get buried in post production because, you know, they, they, they look up and they're like, oh my gosh, I've been editing for three hours. What have I got done? And they don't have a lot to show for it. And so, and you know, there, there's probably people listening. I can hear people right now, like <laughs> typing, typing on their keyboard. They're like, Leon, I'd never spend two minutes on an image. But even if you, you were just doing one, in, one minute per yeah. image, that's still 12 hours. So we, and anytime you've, if you've ever heard me speak on post-production before um, or in the future, my theme is always about time and math. And it, it sounds so boring, but I think it's really powerful to think about you know, if you could shave that down, 700 images, if you could shave it down to like 10 seconds per image, you know, you're in a much, much better place. So I want people to think about the, uh, you know, they've got the culling, they, they take care of the culling as a first step. The second step, they're going to establish the good, clean baseline for their images. So think of the color correcting as creating a consistent and clean look from beginning to end. No, no more. You know, I, I think that's one place where a lot of people get lost. They go, oh, I'm going to call and I'm going to edit at the same time. Bad idea. I like to think of post-production in chunks. How can we chunk these together? So let's do all the calling in one, in one batch and let's do all the color correction in one batch. Let's do the creative effects in one batch because you'll find you get into a really good rhythm and a pace and you, you, you feel so much more productive because you're staying focused on the task, which is creating a good baseline image on that uh, set of proofs. So, I think it's good to use presets. Um, so I'm not, you know, down on presets. I think that everybody should use them. I use them. But let's find the three best presets, like your go-to presets. So maybe you have a good preset that just adds a little contrast, adds some saturation, maybe some sharpness or something that is your own unique kind of first, you know, first layer of the color correction process. And I would encourage you to create that preset and apply it when you import your images. That way, once you're ready to go and you're ready to edit, you've kind of already got the, the, the repeat stuff done. You're not going to be adding contrast to every single image or copy-paste to, to apply that to every single section. Um, so you've got your baseline preset. Then I would encourage people to find their favorite black and white preset. Their favorite. Not their favorite 10, <laughs> because you're still going to get lost in like tinkering. So find your favorite black and white preset and keep it handy. And then there's a the one that I, I kind of call like the, the money shot effect or whatever, you know, like the, the really like really cool creative effect that they love. So kind of keep those ones handy in your own separate preset folder so that you can quickly get to those. If you're in the, the initial stage of just basic baseline color correction, 
creating good, clean consistency from beginning to end, you can kind of rely on those three and not get too far off the path. And so that's that's the number one. Don't overthink it because too many people get into the presets and they've got a thousand choices and it consumes their time. Just concentrate on getting a good, clean look beginning to end. Keep it consistent, natural skin tones, um, You know, make it yours and use a couple, maybe two or three presets to get you there. Um, and then you can do the creative stuff afterwards. You know, like once you have the 700 selected, now you can focus on your favorite 20 and just do your creative effects on the 20. I think that's one of the biggest things that will help people because the mindset is clean and simple. You can focus on just one thing at a time and you, I feel like you can get a lot more done. I mean, that's, that's how I teach our editors to do it. And, and you know, as you can imagine running a business that's based on post-production, I've got to have editors that are an extremely accurate and consistent, but also very swift. But it is possible to have a swift workflow that's actually very high quality. They're not mutually exclusive. Yeah, with that, I mean, again, you know, time is one of my biggest themes. Um, you know, photographers, when it comes to creating their art or editing, you know, in Lightroom or Photoshop, most of them treat it more like, you know, some some kind of maybe like an LSD trip or something, or you know, they, they treat it like some um, open-ended creative exploration. And I think that they should treat it more like uh, a competitive event. So, like, I'm not a runner, but my wife is, and she has a running group that she's a part of, and they can tell you exactly what their personal record is for running a mile, you know, what their fastest time is for running a mile. They can also tell you exactly what their time was for a marathon. The last marathon event that they ran, they knew, they know exactly down practically to the second how long it took them to run that event. <laughs> so <laughs> photographers don't know, right? Like you talk to photographers and you say, how long does it take you to color correct 500 images? Oh, no and idea, most, yeah. Yeah, most of them don't know because they just they, they start editing and they're done when they're done. I did this myself in the early, early days when I started editing. I realized that my client was paying me the same amount whether or not it took me two hours to do post-production or it took me 20 hours to do post-production. They're paying me the same amount. And it actually is worse for me if it takes me 20 hours because if we do the math on what I'm getting paid then per hour, let's say – it gets really, really worse. <laughs> it yeah. gets really bad. So what I did, and this is what I'm going to challenge your listeners to do. This is what I did. I, I took a pad of paper and a pen, and every every function, every, every post-production step of the way, I recorded what I did. So was I doing culling? And then how many images I uh, was, was culling or color correcting? And then the exact time that it took me to do that task. So I, I would use a timer, and if I got up to go get coffee or take a phone call or you know whatever, I would I'd hit pause on the timer, and then I'd resume the timer when I when I began because I wanted to have really accurate numbers. And a couple of things happened for me. Number one, just like runners will want to beat their personal record for the fastest mile or whatever, or their fastest uh, marathon. There's something inside of me that kind of kicked into gear where I said, Oh my gosh, like well it took me that long to do calling last time, maybe I can beat it. I've got, you know, 700 images uh, to color correct. Last time it took me so long. And so I'm going to try to beat that. So it gives you something. It gives you like a score. Now you know the score of the game. And now you know how to win. And then I think it, it actually does another thing. It opens up accuracy and, and transparency with your clients. Because now when the bride calls to say, hey, you know, I, I know we're probably a little ahead of schedule, but I'd love to know when I could you know, see my photos. Now you don't have this whole guessing game of like, Oh, um, yeah, maybe I think next week I should have them done. <laughs> right. Like mm -hmm. you should know the moment you come home. Okay. I shot 4,000 images today. It's going to take me this amount of time to call. I'm going to get that to 800 images. And I know that's going to take me this amount of time to edit those 800 images and so on. And every step of the post-production, whether it's downloading your cards or uploading to the proofing gallery. I want your listeners to literally record every step of the post-production and know their numbers. Not just for one job, but for any job they've got 
for the next season because knowing your numbers gives you so much power to become swifter and more accurate, right? Because now you're conscious of the amount of time you're spending. Now you know, like, oh my gosh, it really took me 23 hours to color correct. That's insane. And you're going to want to beat that. Absolutely. And I know we have one more tip of the three, but I wanted to add a couple of things. And I think so, sometimes, I think for us, and I, once again, I'm guilty of this was, and I'm certainly a very much a numbers guy being my backgrounds in engineering was everything always comes back to time and money. And certainly quantity is always, I feel that third one. So we never want to compromise that. We always want to have a great job, the quality of the photos. So I'm sure for, if I speak for Leon, we're not telling our client, we're not telling our, or we're not suggesting to our photographers to cut corners or anything that will compromise quality. But at the end of the day, we want to value our time and certainly the, the money that we can save or make. So that being said, think about how, especially for the photographers that are starting out right now or maybe in their first year or two and yes, the whole, well, I really want to perfect my style. I really want to know how to do this. I, I'm all for that. I think it's important that before we have another professional or you know outsource that we do know what our style is, what we like, and that way we can relay that, for example, to your editors, Leon. But in addition to that is we want to grow our business and don't you feel like it's sort of this cyclical cycle. It's almost like a hamster on the wheel. The reason we're not able to Invest in outsourcing as well because financially we don't have, let's say, the money. We can't budget that for that in our packages. It's just not unjust, unjustifiable. That's probably the number one reason. But the reason we have that is because we're spending so much time actually <laughs> color correcting, right? And you said the analogy of the two hours or 20 hours. Just imagine you save those not even 18 hours but just maybe 8 to 10 hours and you can spend that time doing these other things, which I definitely want you to touch upon, you know, the marketing, the networking, and through that, you're going to make even more money and progress your business far more than if you spend that time doing the same thing over and over again that you can outsource. Uh, so mm-hmm. whether uh, after your third tip, which is to, dare I say, care a little less or beforehand, <laughs> if you can touch upon that, just seeing that big picture for the hesitant ones, that how this is actually going to really help you in the long run to grow your business. Right. I think it's important to look at it this way. If you're spending... Let's just say on average, I, there are several uh, surveys that have been done in our industry where uh, photographers did, you know, they, they talked about their, their post-production and how many hours it took them. And, and the average for three different surveys that I've seen uh, in our industry was about 20 hours total. And so let's think about it this way. If as a photographer, it takes you a total of 20 hours per wedding for post-production, if you could cut that down to 10 hours total, And you could use that 10 hours to go meet with other vendors who are going to refer you. Um, You know, take a vendor out to lunch and, you know, talk with them about your goals as a a photographer and how you love working uh, with them and how you'd love to get more referrals through them and how, you know, you want to develop a relationship. Um, How many more bookings could you take in 10 hours in a 10-hour block, right? Like for most people, a consultation, maybe it's anywhere between like 30 minutes to an hour. Um, so how many more consultations could you take to, you know, potentially get more bookings, right? Um, so in a 10 hour block, could you do four or five consultations? You know, that's including like your email, initial email correspondence, and then actually meeting with them and talking with them about their wedding. I think that having that 10 hours to do other productive things, to market your business, to create those amazing blog posts, to, you know, set up your Instagram feed in a beautiful way that really showcases your work. Um, Those are important things. And I think that you can be really, really strategic. And if you had the freedom and, you know, the weight off your shoulders to spend that 10 hours doing other productive things that create business for you, you'll see that, you know, if you get two more weddings out of that 10 hours, it's totally worth it. You know, if you could get one more wedding out of that 10 hours, it's still worth it. You know, if you get another um, another vendor that you had never worked with before that you come across and you start developing a relationship with them, um, you know, they turn out to send you three or four more uh, weddings throughout a season. I mean, that's amazing. So there's a much more power, I think, in that aspect than just simply slogging through you know, another 700 images in Lightroom. Because I think at the end of the day, most photographers will tell you they love the creative process 
you know, being out in the field, but they didn't become a photographer because they love the editing. They became a photographer because they wanted to have a camera in their hands and go create cool stuff. And it kind of ties in with um, this other concept that I really love to encourage photographers to do, and that's just to get really good with your camera. Be really good at your exposure values, you know, getting your exposure right, because that translates to faster post-production. Be really, really good at capturing and um, engaging your client during the shoot so that they look their best, because that translates to faster post-production, makes your job easier in selecting images. But be really, really good at your craft as a photographer, because you don't want to rely on post-production as your main shtick, right? Like as a photographer, if you're relying only on your post-production, then we're kind of missing the point. Like the, the client hires you to capture them in a creative way and to capture their essence of, you know, their personality, whether it's, you know, maybe an engagement session or corporate headshots or a wedding or whatever, there still has to be this amazing connection between the photographer and the client. So I would encourage people to focus on their skills using their camera and getting the very, very best images they can because then the post-production becomes a lot easier. And, and I think that, that, you, that your time is much better spent. Even if you took that 10 hours and said, okay, I'm going to take, you know, two hours for contacting vendors, two hours for following up with my current clients, two hours for this and that, and you, and you kind of break it all up and you say, I'm going to carve out two hours for just going to shoot. You know, like how fun would that be? Like that's kind of the dream, right? The photographer's dream where, you know, you have a random Wednesday afternoon and you just go on a, on a photo walk and you push your creative vision. You know, you, you try new things, you become more comfortable with your camera. So I think that that is far, far more important. And um, I think that we need to look at it as, as a whole and go, if I could book more weddings, if I could get more clients in 10 hours, then it's worth it. And to echo everything you said, I think the mindset, as I'm listening to you, some light bulbs are going off in my mind. And I think the mindset has always almost been reversed where a lot of the photographers, and by all means, I say, without a doubt, don't compromise style, of course. And love what you said sure. about knowing to certainly how to use your camera, getting it right in the camera, even little things like framing it so you'll spend less time cropping or, of course, the exposures. You don't have to mess with too much of that in the editing, in the color correction. But a lot of us are in the mindset of, well, I'll outsource color correcting or album design, whatever it might be, when I book more weddings, instead of the other way, <laughs> which is in order to book more weddings, I need to make the time to do those things, like you said, the marketing, the networking, even something fun like just going out and taking photos, improving. But in order to do that, how are we going to get time for that? And I know that some of us that are listening could be a little guilty of this. How many of us still have a full-time job and when we get home, some of us might have kids, so we got to spend some time with them, of course. But mm -hmm. then we scramble around 8, 9 p.m. at night for a few hours <laughs> to go on Lightroom and edit maybe 50, 100 photos. And we'll do that again the next day and the next day because our clients don't really give us that deadline. Not like if we had a, a so-called conventional employer where this mm -hmm. got to be done by Friday. Then, of <laughs> course, we have to make it done by Friday. But when we're our own boss, that we get a little complacent, would you say, and also that that's what's really causing us or rather preventing us from growing our business. Uh, so just kind of a little comment to everything you said. And if anything else you want to add to that, as well as I know you have one last point, which is the whole, you know, you want to get it good enough. It doesn't have to be perfect, but sometimes you have to let it go a little bit. But uh, any thoughts to any of that stuff or additional things you want to add? You're right, and I think photographers would actually benefit to having a hard deadline. One thing I love seeing is when photographers come to me and they say, man, you know, my turnaround time for weddings was like seven weeks, and the brides were like uh, amazingly patient, but I could tell that they were getting a little antsy to see their photos. So seven weeks from the wedding in this day and age is really, really long. So what I love to see is like I, I've had photographers come to me and go, oh my gosh, like I've got four weddings that I'm backed up on. Can you help me? Can I just send you all four and just kind of help me get caught up? And then they deliver those to the client. And for some of those, like for the last two weddings, let's say, maybe that was a double header weekend from the week before. The client is just getting back from their honeymoon and the photographer delivers those photos. The photographers always call me or send me an email and go, oh my gosh, 
that the bride was so impressed that I got the photos to her two days after she got back from her honeymoon. Like that's impressive. And so I think that what photographers should do is tell their clients, give themselves a hard deadline, tell their clients, so I will have your photos delivered within three weeks of your wedding or four weeks of your wedding, whatever you're comfortable with. But you have to beat that number. So if you say four weeks, deliver in three. If you say five weeks, deliver in four. Deliver it a week ahead to your clients and watch their response, okay? Because you set the expectation and then you've beat it. And it's amazing. Um, and that's the bride who's going to be much more likely to refer you. That's a bride who's going to go out on social media and talk about how amazing you are. Versus the bride who maybe she's waited six or seven weeks. She's already kind of talked to you. And you've said, yeah, I'll probably have it to you next week. And then you miss that deadline. Ugh, that's a bummer. Like the, the bride is not happy. You know, she may still be nice, but she's not happy. You've kind of like, you know, you've, you've kind of lost and so I think it's better for photographers to give themselves a hard deadline and have a strict schedule and go, okay, mindset. Maybe I don't even tell my clients how long it's going to be, but I know for sure I want to have each wedding this season delivered to the client within three weeks or four weeks or whatever. Give yourself a hard deadline and then actually go to your calendar and mark on the calendar your due date for each wedding for delivering it to the client. I think that's Again, it's, it, what I love to talk about with post-production is all about time management and basic math. It's simple stuff, but most photographers don't love that process, but it's so powerful. Totally, so powerful. Leon. The scary thing, speaking of math, is if we were to really do what you suggested earlier, which I love, is to write down, keep track of everything you're spending time on from the entire workflow. And if we were to do a quick math, oh, I get paid let's say $3,000 uh, $3, for this wedding, and I spent, yeah, 30 hours of which you, you have to consider, the, of course, the time you shot, the engagement session, even if there's one, the, the meeting, the color correcting, the blogging, the networking, the mm -hmm. outsource, all that stuff. Before you know it, you're not really making what you thought you would, and that's another sort of hit home reality. It's, oh my goodness, you know, some of us probably, dare I even say, might be making a little more than the minimum wage after all the time. <laughs> Now, you can't even look at the time that you're actually sitting and editing. You also look at the time you're probably not being efficient. I'm sure you get a lot of photographers that might not realize, well, yes, you could be sitting and watching TV or maybe on an inefficient laptop trying to do something. And instead of even taking just two, three hours, they're spending five, six hours, but they don't really account for those two, three extra hours because of these things they're not doing with an inefficient workflow. But all of those things don't have to worry when they do outsource. I'm a testament to this. I wouldn't be able to be doing this podcast, certainly have you as a guest, if I didn't start outsourcing. I wish I started a lot sooner. My mindset has been completely different from before. And especially for a lot of us that have that full-time job still trying to get our business going, I really think this is the one area that's holding us back from taking that next step. So a couple other things, Leon, that we want to talk about. I know um, the last thing, sort of me being a little devil's advocate and the cynic is, well, Leon, you know, I, I want to be in charge of my own style and creativity. I want to have control over everything. It has to be absolutely perfect, even if it takes forever, but I got to go through every single one and approve of it or I got to go through every single one and edit it or at least approve of it just have all that control for sure. individuals like that with that mindset which certainly isn't wrong but would, would there be any advice or tips or just anything you would say to them maybe to kind of align them or maybe to just get them a little more just to get them a little more understanding of the benefits of outsourcing Totally. And I, I want to touch maybe on, um, you know, one small technical detail uh, that, that might kind of break this concept open for some people, too. Number one is that, you know, you're you don't have to give up full creative control of your imaging if you do outsource. A lot of people feel like, you know, there's there's no way I could trust someone else with this. But any good editing company, ours included, of course, is going to spend time with you to establish your preferences. I actually, I can't really think of any of my competitors out there who have a take it or leave it approach. You know, like, hey, here's our color correcting and that's what you get. <laughs> so every service that I'm aware of that's out on the marketplace will work with you one-on-one. -on -one, and that's usually done through samples. Okay, so 
you're going to send maybe a dozen images. Like for our service, people will send a dozen images. We process them and we post them for their review. And they may love it, but they may also have some feedback. And so what we want to know is how do we do on overall brightness, contrast, white balance? Overall, how, how close are we? Does it need to go punchier? Does it need to go softer? Uh, does it need to go warmer or cooler and those types of things? So we work with all of our clients to establish personal preferences. And those personal preferences go with every order in the future. However, there are still photographers who go, you know what, that's, that's great, but like, you know, the creative process I could never outsource. Don't then. Okay, use that established baseline that we created with you. And then you've got the opportunity to take your favorite 20 images or whatever and do your, your, your final touches on them. So here's how it works with every uh, what editing service out there. They're Lightroom based usually. And with Lightroom CC, there's this uh, feature called Smart Previews. So basically, you're going to export a catalog and Smart Previews and upload that to a service. And when you get the file back, basically what you're getting is a new Lightroom catalog. And so it connects with your RAW files on your hard drive, meaning that it's almost as if you paid somebody to come into your office, sit there and do the editing and then walk away, right? So now you have the opportunity to go review everything that we've done. If you wanna add warmth, um, you wanna add contrast, or you wanna add any creative effects, you can do that. And everything is still within the Lightroom ecosystem. So you haven't really lost anything. It's not like we're gonna send you JPEGs back and you just kinda of have to deal with that. So everything is still very agile and you can still have a lot of creative control. A lot of our photographers who are high volume you know, they just, they send us the Lightroom catalog, we establish that clean baseline, boom, it goes right back to them, and then they, or one of their assistants, will pull the money shots from the day, add black and white conversions, add creative effects, and then export to the client. And I think that's a, a winning workflow. I think that's a, a good way to look at it. So you're not going to lose creative control. But with that last point of care a little less, the, the concept sounds really maybe too cavalier or, or a little, you know, brash, but it's really not. I mean, and here's the point of it. The point really is just that you and I and most photographers, when it comes to presenting to the client, we're perfectionists. We want to put our best work forward. But again, touching on the concept of being really, really good with your camera, really good with working with the client, making sure that they're comfortable in front of the camera and finding, you know, cool settings and good light, all that stuff, working really well as a photographer and doing your job in the field makes it easier in post-production. And so it, let's just say, <laughs> for, for this argument's sake, that you've done a great job. You've got some killer images, really captures the essence of your subjects, and now you get everything into Lightroom. And again, kind of tied with the, the, the first point of don't overthink it, you have to realize that your client the the bride and groom or maybe the senior you know who's about to graduate high school uh, they don't see the difference between you know 10 points of contrast or 50 points of yellow they can't see that difference and added to that is that they're not going to see your images on a calibrated monitor um, which by the way every one of your listeners needs to have a calibration device for their monitor if they don't have one at this moment they need to stop listening go to amazon buy a calibration device for their monitor and be done. Okay, everyone should have one. It should be like required when you become a photographer. But aside from that, like <laughs> you have to realize that when, we, when we're doing our work on the computer, it's easy to get lost in the details. Like, oh my gosh, does it need just a little more yellow? Does it need maybe a little more contrast? Maybe a little less saturation? And you start adding all of these decisions to every single photo, that just equates to time. But then you have to realize, does that bride and groom see the difference. If I spend 30 more seconds adjusting the contrast and the white balance and really, really, really fine tuning it mm -hmm. to be like that amazing, does it pay <laughs> off? You know, like we have to realize that the client is, they're not color specialists. I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example. For me, when I worked in a camera store, so this would be late 90s, early 2000s, I was selling cameras 
we had a, a full service lab in the back and every time I needed a print, the lab manager would come to me and he'd, he'd slap six prints down on the counter for me and he'd go, which one do you like best? And I just look at him and I go <laughs> like, mm, I, I don't know. Like, well, what's the difference? I can't really see it. And remember, like at that point I was not a rookie. So I'd already been a photographer for many years and you know, he'd go, oh, this one's more magenta. This one's more yellow. This one's a little bit brighter. This one's a little more contrasty. You know, he'd point it out to me. I go, Oh, okay. Yeah, I kind of see that. So even for me, somebody who was in the industry as a photographer working at a camera store and a lab, like it was still hard for me to see some of those subtle differences. So when I say care a little less, I'm not saying, you know, put out crap. What I'm saying is evaluate how many decisions you're making per image and can you get it to the ballpark where it looks clean and it looks natural and looks normal and the client um, is not distracted by your post-production, right? Like that's kind of another issue altogether. But can you get it to a nice, clean, balanced image where it's it, maybe it doesn't hit your 110% um, post-production, but maybe it's 80 or 90. You have to realize that the client is still going to look at that, and if they see themselves as beautiful and you know they've got joy or emotion and they they think that you did a great job creatively capturing them then you've already won. You could probably show them the, the file out of camera and they'd be amazed because they're more connected and more concerned with how they look, right? And Absolutely, so the, the 10 points of contrast and the 50 points of, of yellow, you know, they're not going to see it. Yes, we want to deliver amazing images that have been well-balanced, professionally balanced, and they're look, they look clean and consistent. But um, for those who can't afford to... to, to use an outsourcing service like they have to be able to pull back just a little bit and go you know what i may not be able to give them my my ultimate vision at this moment but i can get them a proof and you know what your time is better spent because if they order a print later on down the road or they want a big you know canvas or something you can always kind of most workflows will allow you to pull that image back in and go okay i want to fix this one up a little bit now I can be concerned with the 10 points of contrast because that equals a hundred bucks in my pocket. Now, those are some great points. Um, uh, my, I always said that you should get to a point where, and we have the blog images, the wow images, like you said, the ones that we could, as an artist, we can still even take it into Photoshop and, and edit a little bit more if we want, the ones that we're going to really showcase on our website and blog. That's great. Those are your favorites. But the other seven, 800 plus, to get it to a point where if the bride and groom are to share those images to their family and friends, which of course they would, but to the public, Facebook, Instagram, you're going to feel proud and comfortable. You're not going to be, oh my goodness, why did they show that image? It hasn't been color corrected. It's not <laughs> rotated. I totally didn't do this. And we're embarrassed. That kind of right. thing. Get to the point where you're going to be proud. If they were to put your logo on it, that you're going to be very proud of yourself. So that's my sort of level of good enough is yep and right. believe me i've in six seven years i'm so embarrassed to look back at my color correction from earlier on and hopefully i improve but certainly that's something that we should strive for and definitely the other thing is just to the point where you're either going to be saving time you're going to make more money or of course your quality isn't going to improve but if your quality is not going to improve that much more you definitely have to question is it, it's worth spending that time and all so a couple of things as we slowly wrap up towards the end, and I love all the tips that you provided, and certainly at this point now is, well, maybe there's some still on the fence, and certainly others that a light bulb went off in their mind and go, oh my goodness, how did I know about this? And I wouldn't be surprised, even for me, even after all these years, sometimes I forget that there's amazing services like what you're offering, and there really is, well, no catch, right? They can send a dozen or so of the test proofs or files to try it out, see how they like things, and then go from there. But a couple other points I want to see if you wanted to echo as well is outsourcing for me now, the color correcting part, it's just a huge sigh of relief. Just after I get back from a wedding and I can call the image, that's the exciting part, the images I photograph, what I want to share. And I actually can spend more time on the blogging even, just be more excited to refine the images I'm going to share the my best work and all. But outsourcing actually has motivated me, inspired me, encouraged, whatever it might be to, to do better because I'm telling myself, well, I'm investing a few hundred dollars per wedding. I better make the most of the time that I'm saving from, well, not mm. color correcting, you know, like I'm, that's mm -hmm. going to push me to, 
to network, to market, and that's a great thing instead of the other way, which is, well, I'm not really spending that much. I can spend more time. That mindset has been completely shifted in my mind. And certainly, I think I mentioned this earlier, the bottom line is I would not be able to be on this Skype session with you if I didn't outsource because I'd be bogged down at my computer doing <laughs> that. And who knows what this would lead to and getting this message to our listeners, but to our own audience, our photographers and colleagues and all, just imagine the time that they would get by outsourcing and to remove that and to remove those memorable things they could do or progressing their business. There's always a saying like you never, you never uh, regret spending that hard earned money and getting something really great out of it. You never go back and go, well, I wish I didn't do that. I wish I saved that money. I wish I didn't have that experience or that time, whatever mm -hmm. it might be. Mm -hmm. But yeah. so just a few things if you want to touch on in those. Otherwise, we'll wrap into certainly talk about essential edit, a little promo code to get our listeners started and all. But anything else you wanted to add a bowl to what we talked about with post-production workflow and everything? No, I love what you said. And I, th I think that what it comes down to is that return on investment. And, you know, it's like a, such a cliche phrase, but you have to think about it. Like if I'm going to spend a hundred bucks or 120 bucks to outsource this color correction, um, how much could I earn? Could I earn 500 or could I earn a thousand in that amount of time that I would have spent, you know, doing the post-production? Um, but you were also right. The other thing I wanted to mention is that any good service that's out there, you know, I can't speak for everybody, but I know for our service, um, there's there's multiple layers. I mean, we want to we want to connect with our clients as if we were hired personally to come work in their office. So it's not like we're just you know some massive group that's faceless and nameless that you you don't really connect with. You know, it's not like you're sending your photos through some. Um, you know, software, some autocorrect software, like we're real people, we're a real team of creatives that love our work. And um, so we have multiple layers here, right? So like we talked about the samples, you can dip your toes in the water and just go like, well, oh, I'll send you 12 images, like, let's see what you guys can do. And that's really for us just a way of starting the conversation. A lot of people go like, hey, that's better than I can do. So I'll just take that. And then for other people, they go, you know, I want it a little brighter or darker. So then they send in an order. And our process is such that we actually deliver your files before we send you the invoice. So we send you your Lightroom catalog, and then we send you a link to your invoice. So you have a chance to review everything before you actually pay for it. Now, most of our clients who love us and you know are just in the routine, they just put a credit card on file with us like they would their album company or, or whatever. But you know, in the beginning, if you're a little timid with this process, you know, don't be afraid because any good service is going to want to work with you because we look at it as a long term thing. This isn't kind of like, a, you know, oh, cool, let's just get one order per person. No, like we want to develop a, a process and, um, you know, a relationship with our clients so that they can experience that peace of mind. Like you said, like you send your work off. You've got this peace of mind. The weight is off your shoulders. You know you can be productive and create more business for yourself. Um, and then when you get the files back, you're happy. You're, you're like, okay, cool. Like the heavy lifting is done. Now I can get down to the creative work and get these delivered to the client. So any good service is going to want to work with you and they're going to want to hear your feedback and they're going to want to implement that feedback. Um, but at the end of the day, like, you know, to be very honest, we are still human. You know, like I said, we're not just some autocorrect software. We are real humans sitting at Lightroom at computers doing the work. So for our company down the road, let's say we've established your preferences. Everything's clicking. It's amazing. But four or five months down the road, you get a job back and you go, man, I don't know. This one, the, the reception is a little too warm or it's a little too contrasty or whatever. No problem. You know, take a couple screenshots, shoot me an email and say, Leon, can you guys take a look at this one again? Here's what I'm seeing. Um, and just tell me what you're seeing. How could we improve it? I'm glad to get that back into production. And usually if we have a redo, we get you files within 24 hours. So I would say for anybody who's afraid of the process to step into it because there's a lot of freedom in the process. I think, total side note here, but I think one of the reasons that film has become so popular today is because people got so frustrated with the post-production process <laughs> that they yeah. kind of wanted to send their stuff off to somebody. But and film kind of seems like the cool and you know kind of kind of wave, kind of the, that that new um, trend, right? And I think it's a lot of it has to do with the fact that 
the, the post-production is, is taken care of. Most people didn't realize back in the film days, before everybody had a digital camera, most people didn't realize that at any good pro lab, the film was being um, professionally processed through chemistry that was checked daily and balanced daily for really accurate color. And then the film would go to color correction specialists. Every frame on that roll of film was being color corrected. And then they would get their four by six proofs. This is old school, Henry. <laughs> <laughs> so, like I said, this is like '90s. Well, you know, when I'm everybody was shooting that. film. Yeah, so you, yeah. you can't. There, there's no cynics out there because we think we covered all the different angles from the ones that might not want to invest from digital to now film shooters. I, yeah. I don't shoot film, but what you said it made me chuckle because. I thought I'm going to get into film just for that reason, which is, I'm sure, a horrible reason to get into it. But just sometimes when there's less control, it makes things a lot easier. But I, I love that you are outlining the process. And to be honest with you, this is exactly why I wanted to bring Leon on the show to bring you. Was that just your warm demeanor from the very moment that you you sent the message on, on Instagram? And by no means, I don't have like thousands and thousands of followers on getting this started but that you treated me like, you know, of course, with respect, with courtesy, but just that friendly demeanor. And when I went to your website, I love the FAQs, the information. I've always been about giving back and not worrying too much about what you're going to get in return. And that always will, will come in due time. And I love that I'm talking to the founder, the owner of the website, of the company, instead of just somebody random and all of a sudden, if I sign up with you, I'm going to hear from somebody else kind of thing. So it's just right. great that everything... Right now, it's through you, and I'm sure that's something that will really reflect well on our listeners. Yeah. It all comes down to trust, I think. And in this business and in, in my line of work and editing for photographers, it really comes down to trust. Um, because if somebody has any apprehension and they don't feel like they can trust a service, they're not going to do it. And so that's why I really like to take the frontline approach on our social media and the frontline approach on the emails and really keep that consistency. I'm the link between my crew who I work with to, you know, make sure that every edit is perfect and the photographer. And so that's why I like to reach out personally because I think that it says so much more, you know, and I think that what I've realized is that photographers, they have, we have to build that bridge of trust for them to ever want to use our service. And um, personally, it's just who I am. I, I love taking personality tests, and I found that I'm a connector. I'm a person who loves connecting people and connecting with people. And so it just comes naturally, <laughs> I guess. That's wonderful. Well, I can't believe basically an hour has flown by since we started this interview. And so we really appreciate our listeners tuning in and hope you got a lot out of this interview with Leon of Essential Edit. Now, Right after you listen to this, guys, what's the next step? I'm sure we all have definitely a dozen, but if not hundreds and hundreds of photos to be color corrected. Wouldn't we rather, well, maybe blog our favorites instead or network or even go out and have a walk in the park, whatever it might be. But I'm sure we have some photos to be color corrected. Why not start right now and check out Leon Services at Essential Edit. So if you don't mind, Leon, if you don't mind giving just a little plug, but we'll have all the information in the show notes, but a little bit more about your website, where they can find you, even social media to get things started. Yeah, my jam right now, I'm loving the interaction on Instagram. Uh, so you can find us at Essential Edit on Instagram. And of course, that's me running the account. It's not uh, like a team of social media people. <laughs> it's really me. Um, and that's why I like to put my photo in the, uh, in the, in the profile. But certainly by email, if you have any questions about post-production, whether it's retouching or album design or color correction or culling, I would love to chat with you. So, you know, like I said, not a requirement to be a client at all. Um, I'm, I'm glad to give this advice freely. Um, it's how I spend most of my day. So um, send me an email, just simply leon at essentialedit.com. And, uh, you know, our website is essentialedit.com. And for anybody who might be on the fence, uh, anybody who might be wondering if this service is for them, um, you know, obviously we talked about doing the samples and all, but I'd love to provide a promo code to all of your listeners. So let's just use the promo code Henry when you place an order on our website and that'll get you 20% off. Um, and hopefully that will help some of you who are feeling little shy about this process. Hopefully that'll help you, um, you know, just, just step in and, and give it a try. Well, thank you so much, not only for being on the show, Leon, but also for that awesome promo code. But that's right, you guys, there is certainly no catch to this. The main reason I want to have Leon on this episode, because I've been getting 
few emails about post-production workflow. A lot of us are struggling with that. And this is something that I'm doing every single day, practically every wedding now is the outsourcing. Yes, I know how to edit in Lightroom and color correct. I've done it many, many times. But at this point, I wanted to do this podcast. I want to have my other ventures like in travel and such. And I knew that I needed to have somebody handle the color correcting. And this is going to open so many doors for you. When you look back in a few months, a few years, I hope that you're going to feel, I'm so glad that we did this. I'm, I'm so glad that I started to outsource. And if at the very least, to gain some tips, advice from this interview that will help you in your workflow. Thank you again so much, Neon, for spending this beautiful Wednesday morning. I know you're near San Diego and Encinitas. I actually call it Ensenada. That's in, that's in Mexico. <laughs> you were telling me where you're at. So as we wrap up, but how's the day over there? It should be nice and warm and sunny. Summertime, so wedding season is pretty much right in the middle of it. So even better reasons to start thinking about workflow. But how's the weather over there? What are you up to for the 4th of July weekend and all? Well, man, this uh, this is a beautiful day in San Diego, and um, my kids are doing junior guards. I have two boys, 10 and 12. They're doing junior guards, which means they are on the beach uh, all morning until about noon. And um, I think there's some beach time involved for the family this afternoon. For the 4th of July, we will be with friends doing the barbecue thing. You know, uh, one of the side note things is, um, you know, photography – uh, Photoshop and editing and all that stuff used to be kind of a hobby for me. And so when it became a career, I needed to find a new hobby. And my hobby is Brazilian jiu-jitsu. So wow. on Monday, on Monday, I will be going to the gym to do some jiu-jitsu with my buddies. And um, then I'll be off to the uh, barbecue. Well, look at that. That sounds a lot more fun than sitting at a computer for all day long doing something, you know, <laughs> whether it's in our, well, conventional job or even in photography. And hopefully we didn't pull a few nerves there, but that's a great way to spend the 4th of July weekend. And thanks again so much, Leon. I hope that uh, our listeners will take you up on your offer and more than anything, they'll get in touch with you. But thank you again for being on the Wedding Photography Podcast and we'll stay connected. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on. I had a great time. Uh, it was a great conversation, and I do hope that uh, some of your listeners will be in touch. Thanks again, Leon. Have a great day. Thanks. You too. All right, my friends. Glad to have you on the other side of this episode of the interview I hope you had a blast and learned a lot. I'm sure with Leon, we could have gone on for another hour or two talking about even more thoughts, tips, advice, just things to speed up our workflow and make our lives a lot more rewarding, more fulfilling, and especially doing wedding photography. Just a few highlights of what Leon talked about because there was just so much, but I really love his three mindset, his three points, which were the mindset of don't overthink things knowing your pace, and also, in a weird way, but very true, care a little less. Just the idea that it's not about how many presets or actions you have or, or the latest version of this program or anything like that or the nitty-gritty details, like if I move the slider a little more to the left, add a little more contrast, a little more color, desaturate, whatever it might be, it's not about that. The idea is that you want to make sure your work is, well, good enough the mindset that you're timing yourself, you're working as efficiently as possible. You're not wasting time doing something that can only take an hour and end up taking three hours for you. The idea that you want to get the photos good enough where your brides and grooms are going to be happy with it. And also just being mindful of how you're doing everything, the time you're taking, how you're doing things. And that's going to free up even more time for you to do other stuff, to grow your business with the marketing, the networking, even personal things like going out, going on a vacation like I'm going to do in the next few days, having time with your family, and certainly to take your business to that next level where you're going to outsource that color correction part to a reputable company like Essential Edit, where you're going to be able to invest a few hundred dollars depending on how many images, how much editing you want done and such, but to another company. But the time that you're going to save from not having to color correct yourself, you're going to be able to do other things with that time and make even more money and even have more free time. 
So it's just a snowball effect of the benefits of outsourcing your wedding post-production. And as a friendly reminder, if you're still on the fence or you just want to give it a shot, no strings attached, just want to see if this is going to work for you, well, definitely get in touch with Leon at Essential Edit. Contact him. If you are on board, use the promo code Henry to save 20% off your order and see that's going to help you on your next wedding and the extra time you have, make the most of it. So on one hand, I am encouraging you guys to consider this. On the other hand, hopefully if you do, the time that you have now, definitely make the most of it. Don't just go ahead and invest in post-production with the color correction, maybe even album design or even advanced retouching, the different services that Essential Edit provides. But the time that you're going to save, definitely make the most of it. That's the other part of it. You just don't want to go ahead and invest the money, have this free time, and not make the most of it. Use that to improve other aspects of your business. And also, perhaps, to do other things that you'll never get a chance to when you're too busy sitting at your computer color correcting all day. So that's a little summary of everything. I want to thank Leon so much once again for being on my show and being a guest. I hope you guys got a lot out of that interview. And I look forward to sharing even more interviews with other professionals in our industry to help you with your business. So let's wrap up this episode. I know it's probably about an hour already. I want to get you guys going so you can start on the next step in building your business. As always, with conclusion, if I can be of help in any way, any specific topics, questions, you're always an email away from reaching me, weddingphotographypodcast at gmail.com. You can also send me a message or comment on Instagram, but email usually is the best way. I have everything at one place. I can address your questions and things on future episodes. If you haven't already, as always, you can subscribe to my podcast on all the major podcast apps, iTunes, Google+, Stitcher, all that good stuff. Speaking of iTunes, if you have a few minutes and wouldn't mind, it will help me so much to get this podcast out to even more wedding photographers like yourself is to leave an honest feedback. And if you could to let me know, hopefully iTunes isn't acting up again, but I want to make sure that if you guys could leave a review that I can personally thank you and also offer a complimentary 30 minutes free Skype session to get you guys going on your business. Coming up on future episodes, this will be while I'm gone the next couple weeks in early August, but we're going to talk about a simple question. Have you guys ever thought of this one, which is what actually shows up when someone Googles my business or if anything even shows up? Have you even tried doing that? What comes up on the listing? We're going to talk about that and most importantly, why it's so important and crucial. The difference between making nothing and tens of thousands of dollars is what shows up when someone Googles your business name. Shortly after that, I want to talk about the mindset, the idea why you absolutely have to hustle, 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 and continue to hustle every single day in your business. That you can't be complacent. You can't just think that things are going to magically work out. You have to give your all every single day, even just to get a chance of succeeding especially if you're starting out in the last few months or a few years, the idea, the mindset of always hustling. And shortly after that, I think I'm going to get back to one of my original topics, which is about retirement, savings, all that good stuff. I know it doesn't sound very fun, but I do want to talk about that. Previous episode, I wanted to get to those questions, but that's another one. And related to that, the idea of what it means to work actually in the past in the present right now and also in the future going ahead but at the same time but i'm gonna get going so you guys could get going thank you for tuning in to an extra long episode hope the information was valuable now you guys go on and start working on your business make the second half of 2016 really count as always remember whether you're an aspiring new or even a seasoned wedding photographer there's something we can all do to take our business to new heights Thanks again, everyone. Until next time, goodbye.